In this video, we're going to show brazing using an oxyacetylene torch rig. We're going to start with brazing in an air handler and condenser, though these practices apply to all sorts of copper to copper brazing. First, when brazing, remove any Schrader cores to ensure that you don't build up any pressure in the system, which can blow out your braze. You can also use the insert of a core remover tool to remove cores. In this case, we're showing a new condenser that doesn't have refrigerant in it already. If you're working on a system that had refrigerant in it prior, make sure to follow proper recovery practices and get the system to atmospheric pressure before proceeding. Before cutting copper in the first place, be sure to clean it with an emery cloth or other abrasive pad. Ream or deburr the copper tubing. Here, we're showing how to do that using a NAVAC deburring tool. You can see that when you cut copper, it pushes a burr into the inside of the tubing. This burr can create turbulence if left in place. Use the deburring tool to remove the burr and ensure that the burr or particles do not fall into the tubing. Some techs in critical situations will opt to use needle nose pliers, inserting them into the tube and twist back and forth rather than risk dropping shavings into the tubing with a deburring tool. Use your judgment and your own company policies where these situations might apply. Here we show the effects of failing to ream or deburr. It creates turbulence and turbulent flow on the outlet side, resulting in unnecessary friction and resistance to refrigerant flow. Keep in mind that deburring is especially important when making connections like flare connections, where the burr can impact the quality of the flared surface. Here we show tipping the copper downward and tapping it with the back of the deburring tool to ensure that no shavings fall into the tube. Also make sure not to over deburr in cases where you're going to make a flare connection. This can thin out the edge and cause cracking. When fitting your tubing together, make sure the gaps are not too large. This can result in poor capillary action, creating a braze joint that's really just a cap over the edge that can be fragile. The goal is to draw the alloy into the joint. If you have gaps that are too large, be sure to use reducers or bushings. Next, we purge the air from the system. Then we move it to brazing mode, or what we call flowing nitrogen wall brazing, which flows a very slow amount of pressure, 3 to 5 SCFH, or standard cubic feet per hour. Some nitrogen regulators, like the Western Enterprises regulator on this tank, have preset flow modes with a gauge to show you how many SCFH you're releasing from the tank. If you don't have a flow regulator, you can instead set a regular nitrogen regulator T-handle to a point where it's just barely whispering a flow of nitrogen. 3 to 5 SCFH is a tiny, almost imperceptible amount of flow. Before brazing, make sure you have proper safety equipment, safety glasses, gloves, and a fire extinguisher. It's also a good idea to have some wet rags and a bucket of water handy. To protect the critical system components while brazing, we're showing using wet rag heat blocking putty from Refrigeration Technologies. We use this to protect things like service valves, the paint on the compressor, expansion valves, and sensing bulbs. Next, we're going to show the proper setup of an oxygen and acetylene torch rig. First, keep in mind that you're not supposed to use oil on the threaded connections of your regulators. This is especially true on the oxygen side, as oil or lubricant on the oxygen threads can result in combustion, unless it's specifically designed for that purpose. First, connect your oxygen regulator to the oxygen tank clockwise, or righty-tighty. The same is true for the regulator on your acetylene tank. Use a backing wrench and make sure they're snug. No need to over tighten. Next, connect your hoses to the regulators. In this case, the oxygen is clockwise to tighten, whereas the acetylene is counterclockwise to tighten the hoses to both the regulator and the torch handle assembly. Use a wrench to tighten them to snug. Next, and very importantly, choose the proper torch tip for the job at hand. Use manufacturer's charts to decide on an appropriate tip size depending on the work being done. Larger tips produce more BTUs, 
and are the right choice for larger jobs. But this will also affect the pressures you should set your oxygen and acetylene to, though many technicians, myself included, will typically use a standard setting, like 7 for acetylene and 11 for oxygen. Most charts will show a balanced approach, like 7 and 7 or 5 and 5. Again, the only real way to know is to consult the tip manufacturer on the appropriate regulator settings. Also consider using specialty tips, like a rosebud tip, which is very good for larger jobs, spreading the heat out, or a hook tip for tight areas. Next, turn your regulator adjustments counterclockwise, closing them off completely. Then, open your tanks. Use a refrigeration wrench for your acetylene tank. Do not use a crescent wrench or channel locks. Now, open your oxygen tank. At this point, bubble test all of your connections. This is an important safety step. Now set the pressure for your oxygen and acetylene regulators. When setting the pressure, the torch handles have to be open for dynamic pressure. And bubble test the hoses. As I mentioned before, there's no one tip and setting. Select the tip based on the job. Then set the oxygen and acetylene at the regulator, not at the handle. At the handle, the knob should be almost fully open. You can make very fine adjustments at the handle, but in general, it shouldn't be how you set your flame. Turn clockwise for higher outlet pressure on your regulator and counterclockwise for lower outlet pressure on your regulator. Next, use a proper striker to light the torch. The best practices are to start with acetylene only, but you may want to be careful because lighting an acetylene only flame can create carbon that can cause smoke detectors to go off or create black stains inside spaces. Once you get comfortable with your torches, you may be able to light them with oxygen and acetylene already mixed. This is a common field practice. Next, mix in the oxygen. A carburizing flame has a primary and secondary feather. A neutral flame, which is what we're typically looking for or slightly carburizing, has a very small secondary feather. An oxidizing flame has no secondary feather at all, and we want to avoid that one. Try to get as close to a neutral flame as possible. When heating up tubing, start with the male segment, allowing the heat to conduct down into the joint. Keep the torch moving, moving it in and out to get the entire joint to dark or medium cherry red, or at least one whole section of the joint to dark or medium cherry red. This will allow the alloy to draw into the connection and create a nice cap on the edge. Do not just cap the edge. It's critical that you get the entire joint to that cherry color and draw the alloy into the joint. That's what actually makes the bond. Next, we're going to show why it's so critical to flow nitrogen at that 3 to 5 SCFH. If you fail to flow nitrogen, cupric or copper oxide can build up inside the tube which can cause system contamination, clog screens, dryers, and expansion valves. To shut the torches off, shutting off oxygen first and then acetylene is generally considered to be the proper shutdown process that prevents it from popping back into the tip. But again, generally you shut them off simultaneously as quickly as possible as field practice. Always store tanks with regulators turned counterclockwise and the valves off. Next, we're going to show some common base metals that you need to know how to work with. Copper is by far the most common, but keep in mind that something that looks like copper could be brass or copper-plated steel. When you burn through the copper plating on copper-plated steel, you're working with steel, and you have to treat it as steel. Copper conducts heat very well, meaning that heat moves through it easily. It's also flexible and easy to work. You can anneal it meaning you can heat hard copper to make it soft at over 1,000 degrees. Its temperature can also be easily estimated by color, based on the chart shown here, with dark to medium cherry red being the target color for most alloys. That's also true of brass and steel. With all of these metals, make sure not to overheat and burn a hole into the tubing. Copper is also handy because it can be fluxed with regular phosphorus-bearing alloys. We often call these phos copper alloys. Here are some common alloys that would be used within the Harris line. Other brands include Lucas and Solderweld. 
Separate flux is not required for copper to copper brazing, and using flux will just result in a higher likelihood of system contamination. The phosphorus does the job. Brass is a softer metal, and it's copper plus zinc, usually used in cast parts, like valves. It's less thermally conductive than copper and has a lower melting temperature. When working with brass, it's best to work with non-phosphorus rods, like a 45% or 56% flux coated, and work with a separate flux. You would generally be using a paste flux. In some cases, you can get away with using phosphorus bearing rods with brass, but the best practice is to use a high silver content with flux coated or separate paste flux. Here are some of my favorite products. Next, we have steel. You'll run into some valves that are made of steel, and you'll certainly run into steel on compressor stubs if the copper plating is burned through. And in some cases, the stubs may just be steel. When you're working with steel, do not use phosphorus bearing rods. Any rod that says FOSS on the packaging or has phosphorus in them should not be used on steel. Use a high silver flux coated rod or a high silver rod or wire with a separate paste flux, as shown here. And finally, we have aluminum. It's rare that text will work on aluminum in the field, but it's becoming more common. It has a much lower melting temperature and gives you no visual color indication of target temperature. Generally speaking, you rely on the flux to tell you when the temperature is right. Special alloys and flux are required. You will not use the same alloys and flux that you used for copper, brass, or steel. When repairing aluminum, and we're showing an evaporator coil here, we also recommend using an air acetylene torch or a map gas torch, generally when working with aluminum. Here we're going to demonstrate using alloy sol by solder weld, which is a product I've used a lot. We're using it in conjunction with a turbo torch air acetylene swirl tip. I like to use a number three or a number five when doing this sort of repair. This is a repair I've done a lot of. This repair can be done inside the coil pack or on the U-bends as shown here. First, heat the tip of the rod and place it in the flux. Next, heat the base material, then melt the flux over the base material. Keep the heat on the flux until it goes clear and quiet. Then hold the rod over the area, holding the heat over it until the alloy goes flat and quiet, then quickly back away. Finally, clean the flux off, and you have a permanent repair. Again, this product is specifically a repair rod. Now we're going to show a more common type of product, which is an aluminum repair rod or wire with a separate low temperature flux. This is an indirect heating method, meaning that you apply the heat, and then you apply the solder once the heat has been removed. First, heat the base material. Apply some flux around the area. Heat until the flux begins to bubble. And then go quiet. Then back the heat off and apply the rod over the area. There are several products that work in this way, and this is just a general procedure to give you some ideas. Always follow the specific manufacturer instructions. There are other aluminum repair rods that have a flux directly inside the rod, which can also be used effectively. When complete, clean off the area. Pressure test and bubble test to confirm that you've completed a leak-free repair. Aluminum can be successfully repaired in many applications. We've done so in everything from tubing, coil pack, and even microchannel when using proper products and techniques. Now back to the copper brazing. Here we show completing all of our connections, removing the wet rag putty for reuse in the future, and cleaning all of the connections. As a note, allow the connections to cool off for several seconds before cooling them with a wet rag. Inspect all of your connections with a mirror both before and after pressurization and bubble testing. Now we're going to put core remover tools on the system and prepare for our pressure test and later our vacuum. Pressurize the system to the allowable maximum test pressure of the evaporator or condenser, whichever one is lower. Bubble test all of your connections and check with a mirror. Spray the soap bubbles on flat and quiet and ensure that there are no bubbles whatsoever, including microfoam. You have to let the bubbles sit for a little bit before you check for those microfoam bubbles. Allow the pressure test to sit over time and ensure the pressure doesn't drop at all. This video has shown you how to braze copper to copper, work with some other base metals, and some basics of how to repair aluminum. 
Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.